It was amazing. It really was. It was this, this relationship was, it was really. After her 13 year long conservatorship came to an end, famous pop star Britney Spears finally got her life back. But just recently, her ex-husband and father to her two children, Kevin Federline, also known as K-Fed, did an interview with 60 Minutes Australia, where he talked about his relationship with Britney Spears, the relationship that his children have with her, and all the little details of what he thought about the conservatorship. But what does his body language tell us? In this video, we're gonna look at his facial expressions, his body language, his word choice, and try to see what he's thinking, what he's experiencing emotionally, and is he holding anything back? Here we go. What's going on everyone? Welcome back to the Behavioral Arts. My name is Spidey and I use my degree in sociology and psychology, my certification in body language analysis and criminal interrogation, and over 10 years as an award-winning mentalist to teach people all over the world about body language and behavioral analysis. This week we are looking at a really fascinating interview that Kevin Federline, Britney Spears' ex-husband, did with 60 Minutes. There's a lot of great stuff with facial expressions, body language, and most importantly, word choice. There's gonna be a lot of statement analysis in this week's video and I'm really excited. Now, as my regular viewers know, I love to start by showing you the clips that we're gonna be analyzing. That way you have a chance to form your own opinion and try to see what you're seeing with his behavior. Nonverbal behavior, word choice, body language, all of it. So pay attention to what he's saying. Uh, try to see emotionally, what is he experiencing? Are there certain topics you feel stress him out more than others? Trying to give you some clues here. Uh, is there anything, any points where you think he's holding something back? And what are his feelings towards Britney Spears' conservatorship, uh, his, the relationship between his children and their mother? So just sort of get a feel for what you think is going on in his head. Here it is. <laughs> A picture of domesticity in what seems like a very normal middle-class home in Los Angeles. Nobody can prepare you for anything like okay. what I've been through, you know? I mean, nobody, but to me, I, I had a job to do and that was my kids. What happened to you? You disappeared. Uh, yeah. I, think it was probably the best decision that I've made. <laughs> and one of the best decisions I've made in my life. Keeping my boys safe and making sure that they have a relationship with their mother and the rest of the family, that was, that's what I, my role has specifically been in, you know, for me, for myself. Like, I can wake up every day and live with myself knowing that that is what I've been trying to do for the last 15 years. It was different, you know, everything was just, it was amazing. It really was. It was this, this relationship was, it was really, you know, we listened to each other. We talked to each other. We tell jokes to each other. We did all the things that, you know, you do in a new relationship and, but it was magnified by a hundred. So it was really different. Um, until it wasn't discrimination towards me when me and Brittany got together and all this stuff, you know, there were so many things out there. I was never good enough and all oh, you're this, you're that poor white trash loser, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, I was built to be able to take that because it didn't bother me at all. I found out, just found out I was getting divorced. I called my lawyer. The only thing that I told, I told him that all I, all I care about is getting 50% custody of my sons. You know, I, I can't, I, I don't, nothing else mattered to me, nothing. You know, you can't, I'm not the person that will take money over family. I wasn't involved in any of it, so I really don't know how the conservatorship came about. I don't know whose decision it was. I don't know, all I know is that you have a family that is worried about their daughter and trying to do whatever they can to help her. Okay. That's all That's that's all that I knew. I have no part in any of that. So you feel Jamie might have saved his daughter? A hundred percent, I feel like he saved her back then. Both of them were happy for her, you know, because it's not always about what's right, it's about this is what mom wanted, you know, mom got. Yeah, so they, the boys have decided that, you know, 
they they're they're not seeing her right now. It's been a few months since they've actually even seen her. If instead of me, Brittany was dead, sitting here, what would you tell her? I don't know. It's really... That's like the toughest, one of the toughest questions, you know. I try to think about that question. You know, it's hard to like tie it all together because I would want to apologize and then give advice and then ask if there's any way I can help. All right, there it was. So definitely some interesting stuff to look at. And here's the part where I get to hear from you. So you might need to go back and look at that again. There's a lot of little details in there. Pause the video, head down to the comments and let me know what you saw. It could be, you could isolate one clip and say, oh, in this clip, I feel like I saw something going on there. Uh, it could be an overall vibe for the whole thing. You could talk about specific topics, whatever you want, wherever you feel you got something that you're analyzing and you're sort of seeing that there might be something going on there. Let me know in the comments. I really want to hear from you and see what you're feeling towards that interview. Okay, now it's my turn. We're going to dive into these clips one at a time and we're going to see what his nonverbal and verbal communication is telling us. A picture of domesticity in what seems like a very normal middle class home in Los Angeles. The dishes are being done, the dogs being fed. Okay, I want to start with that clip and some of you might be looking at it and going, well, what can we possibly analyze there? He hasn't even opened his mouth yet. But I love to look at the setup in edited pieces like this where there's a narrative that Kevin Federline is going to try to push and there's a narrative that the producers are going to try to push. What's the first thing they're showing us about the subject of the video? And here we're getting quite a bit. We're seeing this guy, you know, just wearing very casual clothes. Like he's not a big Hollywood star. None of his wardrobe portrays that. Very casual clothes and he's serving kibble in a dog bowl. And you've got his wife doing the dishes. So this is the first thing they're showing us about Kevin Federline. This is who Kevin Federline is. Now, I don't know if that's his decision to where the production said, just go on about your day and we're gonna film what you're doing. Or if they told him like, hey, do some stuff that really makes you seem like a casual everyday person. Whatever the case is, that's the narrative that they're trying to push. This is just, a regular family guy, he's not Hollywood, he's not this big celebrity star, he's just a regular guy doing regular guy things, just like you and me, all the things we do in our daily lives, he's doing the same thing. They're trying to make him relatable to the masses. Nobody can prepare you for anything like okay. what I've been through, you know? I mean, nobody, but to me, I, I had a job to do and that was, my kids. Okay, so now he does speak and it's a huge contrast between what he's saying and what we were just shown. Now, first of all, I don't know if this is the first thing he actually said or if in editing this is the first thing they chose to show us, but this is dramatic television. They take you on an emotional roller coaster because first they show us that he's just an everyday guy doing everyday things that we all do as well. You know, we feed our animals, we wash our dishes, but then he starts to speak and it's like, nobody can prepare you for the things I've been through. So bam, all of a sudden, Okay, no, wait, he looks like me, he does things I do, casually dressed, you know, taking care of the household chores, but he's gone through something really dramatic that I can't understand. This is a really effective way to pull you in. Like you thought there was safety, but bam, no, there's something going on here that you can't understand. In terms of how it reflects on him to start with that statement, I'm not sure it's a good look. I get the controversy, I get the drama of him saying that, but you have to keep in mind, a lot of Britney Spears fans are going to watch this special and the moment he says that, if I was a Britney Spears fan, the first thing I would go in my head is like, oh, did you, did you go through a lot of things? Because I bet it pales in comparison to the hell that was the last 13 years of Britney Spears' life. So it's really weird to start with a sentence like that because it immediately polarizes anyone who's a fan of Britney Spears. In terms of body language, I want you to pay attention to one really important thing that happened there that for Kevin Federline happens a lot throughout this interview and it's a slow blink. So as he says, what I've been through, we see it's not a held eye blocking like this. He doesn't say what I've been through, but it's just a slower blink. Usually a blink is very fast, boom, like that. But he goes, what I've been through and just blinks slower. Now, slow blinks can happen for a multitude of reasons, but in a conversation like this, 
Typically, it's one of three things. The first is emphasis. Some people emphasize with a slow blink if they're saying something really important. The second one is recall. Some people, as they think back, they'll close their eyes as they recall what happened, but typically it's held longer and there's usually either head movement or face scrunching. Some people just sit there like this as they recall, but it's pretty rare. Usually there's some sort of moving around or some sort of motion on the face. The third reason we slow blink is something we don't want to face. So think about somebody giving you bad news or something happening that you don't want to deal with. It's very common that we close our eyes and sometimes we even bring our hands like this up to our eyes because it's something we really don't want to see, we don't want to deal with, we don't want to picture. Now the reason I say it's interesting for Kevin Federline is because throughout this interview he does a lot of slow blinks and it's for all three reasons. There are times where he emphasizes with that slow blink, there are times where he recalls and he holds it a little longer and we see that face scrunching and finally there are times where something comes up that he has a hard time with, he doesn't really want to talk about and we see it's not held but we see that slow blink. Like in this case, that's what's happening. I think whatever it is he went through, he wants to move past it, he doesn't want to talk about it. And to further lock in my position of that's the reason that slow blink is happening is he immediately switches the topic to what he had to do for his kids, to a positive topic. So don't want to deal with this, this was unpleasant, I'm switching now and I'm saying something positive and that's the role I had in my children's lives. What happened to you? You disappeared. Uh, yeah, I think it was probably the best decision that I've made. <laughs> and one of the best decisions I've made in my life. A lot going on there with body language and word choice. So the interviewer asks, what happened to you disappeared? And before he even says a word, two things happen. The first is a deep audible breath that we hear in the mic. Second, both his hands at the same time go like this, up like this. Now, hands moving, in conversation is not unnatural. In fact, it's called illustrators. Typically when we talk, we move our hands like this and it's synced with what we're saying as we drive points home. But to have both hands go up like this, it's a very strange gesture. Typically we have things like this, things like this as we speak, but that is very strange and it's called a stop gesture. Think about if you turn around and all of a sudden something's coming towards you, you might do this. It, when you're startled, you do this. Somebody slams the brakes in the car, you might do this. Whenever you want someone to stop, you know, hands come up like this, all fingers up. So the moment she says disappeared, we get that nervous breath, heads looking down, both hands come up. I don't think he likes her word choice. I don't think he likes that she said you disappeared. Now think about who this is. Kevin Federline had a long career where he attempted to become famous because he was a very successful backup dancer but then he tried music and he had a little thing with the WWE and he always kind of seemed to be trying really hard to be famous and it never really kind of worked out for him. So when she said you disappeared, I think this is hitting a sensitive spot for him. I think that's where we're seeing the stop just like, ooh, I'm not sure I like that word with that deep breath as he's looking down. So I think that hit him right in the feels. He doesn't like that word disappeared. And in order to correct that, he makes an attempt to take over the narrative, to say, no, 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 I didn't disappear. That was my decision. Because what he goes on to say is, that's the best decision I ever made. That's word choice. He decided to say that. And then he continues by saying, one of the best decisions I made in my life. So he really wants to make sure, no, no, I didn't disappear. I decided to no longer want to be famous. Also notice how it's sneaky, but he doesn't answer the question. Her question is, what happened? You disappeared. She's looking for an answer. Like, where did you go? She's looking for him to say, you know, I focused on other projects. I worked on this. You know, after this happened, I, I went more in this direction. He's not saying that. He's really focusing. All he's answering is saying, yeah, yeah, that was my decision. It, it was a good decision. Let's look at some really fascinating body language. Right as he's saying that it was the best decision that he made, we get a very nervous chuckle as well as a pacifying gesture. His left hand literally caresses his leg, goes under it, then back to the top, and this is a pacifying gesture. It's self-soothing. So pacifiers is anything that we do to comfort ourselves. Usually they're repetitive, and they often look like a massaging gesture. So when we're stressed or anxious, we might see these gestures as a way to calm ourselves down. As he says, made the best decision I ever made, his eyebrows go up. We see an eyebrow flash. Now, if you go back to the first clip of him, the one we looked at earlier, the entire time, his eyebrows never move. So his baseline is very immobile on the eyebrows. 
But here, as he says, best decision that I made, the eyebrows go up. When the eyebrows go up, it's one of three things. Either surprise, either something really happy, like we go upwards when we're happy, or the most common thing in a conversation like this is we're looking for approval, we're looking for connection. So in this case, he's saying, that's the best decision I made. I made this decision. Notice how I made this decision, right? We're connecting here. So when we're looking to connect, those eyebrows go up. And that's what we're seeing. And then he does it again. When he says, one of the best decisions I've made in my life, again, this time they go up and they're held up for a little bit. Because now he's driving it home. One of the best decisions I made in my life. See? We're friends here. So what does all that mean? Basically, he hears something he doesn't like. He tries to take over the narrative. And he talks about how this was his decision. But as he's saying that, we're seeing a lot of signs of stress. Pacifying, chuckle, eyebrow flash, which isn't a sign of stress, a sign of connection to try to sell a story. So he's really trying to sell this narrative that him disappearing was completely his decision. All right, now we're gonna go on and look at some other clips, talk about his relationship with Britney Spears, some of the things he says about his children and their relationship with their mother, which is really revealing. But before we do, do me a huge favor, hit that subscribe button, turn those notifications on for more psychology content. Keeping my boys safe and making sure that they have a relationship with their mother and the rest of the family, that was, that's what I, my role has specifically been in, you know, for me, for myself, like, I can wake up every day and live with myself knowing that that is what I've been trying to do for the last 15 years. All right, I'm really interested in some of the things he says there, but let's get the body language out of the way first. So I don't think there's much going on here, but it's a good opportunity to baseline because he's talking about something here uh, with his kids and his role over the last 15 years. And we're seeing those illustrators as he's talking, his hands are moving and they're synced with what he's saying. So that's usually how we know how there's synchronicity between thought and words, when the hands are moving with what we're saying. Uh, there's a lip lick there, where the tongue comes out and just quickly kind of licks the upper lip, uh, but it's isolated. There isn't much else going on in that moment, enough for me to say, oh, there's a cluster there, that's something I wanna look into. Uh, and that's a good example of something that happens that because it's alone, it's really not that telling. But let's look at his word choice. So he talks about his role as a father and says, that's something that I could wake up every day and live with myself. That's a really interesting word choice. Typically, that's something someone says in a situation where there's regret. So they say like, you know, yeah, I did this thing, it was regretful, it was wrong, but I can live with myself because there's a silver lining. Otherwise, what's the point of saying you can live with yourself? Why wouldn't you be able to live with yourself? Like imagine if someone just throws that randomly into a sentence where they're telling you about their life. So imagine if I tell you something like, no, I can live with myself knowing that I make YouTube videos. Doesn't that sound weird? Like, what? okay, yeah, sh yeah, of course you can live with yourself. It's, you know. So for me, whenever you hear that sentence, I can live with myself, I could sleep sound at night. It's, there's another side to that. There's another side to that coin where there's regret. There's something they're not so proud of. And he's not saying what it is here, but basically what I'm saying is there's a but there. You know, like I did this, but I can live with myself because I've been there for my kids. So there's a regret that he's not talking about. Could it be some stuff with Britney Spears? Could it be some stuff with the relationship that he caused between his kids and Britney? I don't know, but that choice of words signals regret. It was different, you know, everything was just, it was amazing. It really was, it was this, this relationship was, it was really, you know, we listen to each other, we talk to each other, we tell jokes to each other, we did all the things that, you know, you do in a new relationship, and but it was magnified by a hundred. So it was really different um, until it wasn't. Okay, again, a lot going on there with a statement. So he's being asked about his relationship with Britney Spears. And we start with, it was different. But then he stammers so much before he gets to anything. It was different, you know, it was just, it was amazing. And he's, he's just trying to get to something. And look at, go back and look at how long it takes him to actually get to even a semblance of an answer. And it's almost like there's ups and downs and it's, it's really quite epic. Um, also, he says, this relationship. That's psychological distancing. When we use words that put distance between us and something that's part of us or connected to us, 
It means psychologically we're trying to put some distance between us. It's weird to say this relationship, not our relationship, that's the way you would commonly say it, our relationship was such and such. This relationship wasn't mine, so there's distancing there. Then when he's describing why it was so different and amazing, he says, this was an amazing romantic relationship. And the reason for that is because we listened to each other, we talked to each other, uh, and we, told, well, we, 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 we said jokes, we told jokes. You're not describing an amazing romantic relationship. That's part of an amazing romantic relationship, but that, I have that relationship with friends of mine. I have that relationship with family members. Listening, talking, telling jokes. You haven't explained to us what was so amazing romantically. And when it comes to that, he says, you know, all the things you do in a relationship. Like he's putting it on us to figure that out. He's not filling in those gaps. He's leaving this open-ended statement, um, but it was magnified. So all the, you know, all the things, all the things, I don't, I don't know what they are, but all those things, it was those, but magnified, very ambiguous. Then he ends with, so it was really different. But think about that. He starts by saying it was different. He ends with saying it was different, but in the middle he says, we did all the things you do, you know, in a new relationship. So what's different? What was different? I don't understand. If what you did was all the things you do in a new relationship, then how was it different? It was the same. And then at the end he goes, so it was different until it wasn't. Well, what does that mean? What, what is it not being? So it's very confusing. To be honest with you, I don't even think he knows what he's trying to say here. I think he's just trying to blurt something out. It's not working. He's changing directions. There isn't really an answer to the question. I have no idea what he said. What I do know is this. Right at the end when he says, until it wasn't, there's a very clear look that we call looking askance. And it's this kind of side glance that we throw at people when we don't trust, when we judge, when we just, it, it's very contemptuous. And we see it there right at the end and he kind of looks to his left and it's interesting because there's probably nothing to his left. The entire crew is over here. But typically in our minds, we think of the left as the past and the right as the future. Very often we talk about future goals and aspirations, we go this way. And as we talk about our past, we might gesture a little bit more here. He goes, it was different until it wasn't. And he has this kind of looking askance side glare. So what I think is happening is he's trying to portray himself here as a positive person, but he has negative things to say about their relationship and how toxic it was, but he doesn't want to say them. So he's trying to focus on the positive or he's trying to find something to say to kind of work around it, but he's failing miserably. We're seeing that stammer. We're seeing it was different, but actually, you know, it was, you know, the same, everything you do in a new relationship, but different. But then right at the end, I think he shows us everything we need to know as he goes, until it wasn't. And we get that sort of contemptuous, mistrusting, disapproving, looking askance side glance. Discrimination towards me when me and Brittany got together and all this stuff, you know, there were so many things out there. I was never good enough and oh, you're this, you're that poor white trash loser, blah, blah, blah. But I mean, I was built to be able to take that because it didn't bother me at all. There we have another legendary eye block. And that goes beyond the slow blink because his eyes are closed for a while. They're held closed for a while. And we'll circle back to that because I want to talk about the eyebrows. So throughout most of that, his eyebrows are down like this. Now, we might look at that and think that that's anger because anger is one of the universal human emotions. Every human on the planet experiences anger and expresses anger the same way. And one of the signs is eyebrows that are down and closer together like this. But typically with anger, there's a couple of more things you're gonna see. One of them is the eyes typically open up more like this as we focus on our target. The nostrils open up as well, more oxygen intake when we're angry. And you might see tension in the jaw, but most importantly, when someone is speaking with anger, they spit their words more. So you're more likely to see more of an aggressive tone if they're angry. Even if it's subtle, you're gonna get more of this kind of thing. We're not seeing that. In fact, the only thing we're seeing that might indicate anger is the eyebrows. So we can ask ourselves what else can be causing the eyebrows going down like that. And another common reason for that is thinking, reflecting about something. As we think about things, we might do this. Now, I think it's very possible that that's what's happening here because his eyes are also closed. So going back to what I said earlier, when we close our eyes, sometimes just to think back, to remember something. Now, I don't think it's only that. I think it's an interesting combination here because I think part of the reason he's doing that is because he's thinking back to the negative comments that he had. But another combination that can do this is a bit of anger. I wouldn't say rage, but more like a bit of irritation and that eye blocking like blah, 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 just this nonsense. I don't, I don't want to face it. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to look at it. So 
I think it's a mix of both those things. Recall and let's call it just annoyed. He's just annoyed. And that's exactly the attitude you would get if you talk to anyone who's been in the public eye who gets criticism. Because that's, you know, for years, for decades, the guy has been criticized by pretty much everyone on media, social media. So if you talk to any YouTuber or anyone who's on social media about their negative comments, you're going to get very much that kind of thing. They're not going to be really angry, just a little annoyed as they'll talk about it and they might kind of roll their eyes and it's just irritation. And I think that's what it is. He's irritated. And we see that by how easily he bounces back at the end. Where he just goes, after he talks about it, you know, they were saying blah, blah, blah. He even says blah, blah, blah. Uh, but, I, but it's okay because I was built for that. So he immediately comes back and we don't really see him. It's not taking a toll on him. It's not really bothering him much more than that. There is one gesture though that's important and it's the grooming. We don't see his hands, but we see him adjusting his shirt. We even hear it on the mic. Because it didn't bother me at all. Both his hands tug on his shirt like this. And grooming is anything that we do to fix our appearance, to sort of make ourselves more presentable. But whenever it's the shirt or the jacket, especially with men, when we button our shirts or fix our shirts in the front like this, it's more of a blocking mechanism. It's almost like an armor. So I think he's just sort of shaking it off and he's bringing that confidence up. So I think these comments, these negative comments, they bother him to the extent that they would bother anyone. You know, nobody likes to hear negative comments. But I think throughout his life, he's just figured out a way to just get that confidence back up and not really let it bother him. I think it irritates him, but I don't think it really bothers him that much. Another indication that these words don't really bother him that much is the fact that he says the words. He says, white trash loser. Usually if we feel like words really affect us emotionally or that they're accurate, like we think that the person has a point, we have a hard time saying the words because they affect us. We usually try to psychologically distance. So we might say things like, they said some really rude things, some really mean, demeaning, insulting things. But in this case, he has no problem saying, repeating the words because it's someone else's words. It doesn't affect him. He doesn't feel like it really reflects who he is. So he has no problem just saying the words. That's their words, that's their opinion, it doesn't matter to me. I found out, just found out I was getting divorced. I called my lawyer. The only thing that I told, I told him that all I, all I care about is getting 50% custody of my sons. You know, I, I can't, I, I don't, nothing else mattered to me, nothing. You know, you can't, I'm not the person that will take money over family. Okay, I want to focus on two things really quick right there at the end. The first is that slow blink as he says, nothing else mattered to me. So we're seeing that slow blink and of the three reasons we discussed earlier, I think this is the first one, emphasis. And this is something you're going to see very often with people who are presenting something that is conclusive and often negative. So like, no way, nobody would do that, nothing in the world is more important or in this case, you know, nothing else mattered. So that slow blink with that no is a very common sort of, I'm putting my foot down, nothing was more important. Emphasis. Then he goes on to say that sentence, which is, I'm not the person who picks money over family. Now that's a very interesting statement because it wasn't prompted. She didn't ask him, are you someone who would pick money over family? He volunteered that. So first of all, it's a resume or convincing statement. Convincing statements are things we say to build our character up. We see this very often in criminal interrogation when someone's being asked about a certain crime and they start building themselves up. Like, I'm an honest person, I would never do anything like that. So this is a resume statement or convincing statement. I'm not the person or the type of person who would put money over family. Well, nobody said you were. It's a very weird place to build yourself up like that. Also, yeah, that's a normal thing to be. It's a normal thing to not put money over family. Why are you bragging about this? So imagine if we're hanging out and we're just having a conversation and in the middle of that conversation, without you asking me anything, I say something like, you know, because honestly, I'm not the type of person who would ever rob a bank. Like, okay, fine. Why, why would you say that? Like, why is that even in your head? I don't think he's answering her question. I think he's answering the criticism that he's been receiving over the years that he's a gold digger and he's only after her money and he did a lot of things back in the day just to get money from her. Um, it also reflects that this is on his mind because nobody said, nobody said you put, the interviewer certainly didn't say that you put uh, money before family. So that came from you, that thought came from you. I wasn't involved in any of it. So I really don't know how the conservatorship came about. I don't know 
whose decision it was, I don't know. All I know is that you have a family that is worried about their daughter and trying to do whatever they can to help her. Okay. That's, all, that's, that's all that I knew. That is a terrific clip to demonstrate the two different ways in which he brings his hands up. So we see it twice. The first one is when he says, I wasn't involved in any of it. And we see this, I wasn't involved in any of it. So both hands come up and open up this way as he gestures upwards here. And this is a very, very common gesture when we show innocence. So exposed, open, and it might be this way, it might be this way, but go, I, I don't know, it wasn't me, I, I, you know, I'm innocent. So that's what's happening here. I had nothing to do with this. I'm open, look, I, it's almost like a magician shows his hands, and it's the same thing. We go like this, look, there's nothing, innocence. Now, as he says that, I'm sure a lot of you are gonna notice and comment on this, that we see a one-sided shoulder shrug. As he says, I wasn't involved, one shoulder pops upwards. Now, typically, if you see someone do that, like, it wasn't me, I wasn't involved, and only one shoulder goes up, this is a lack of confidence in their position. Like, I'm not sure about what I'm saying. Usually if we actually don't know something or if we're actually innocent, both shoulders go up. It looks like this, I don't know. But if it's, I don't, I don't, it wasn't me, I don't know, just one side, usually it's a lack of confidence in that position. But in this case, I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. His other arm is up on the couch like this. It's really hard to do a shoulder shrug when your arm is positioned like that. So it's very possible that as he's doing this, we only visibly see this shoulder go up because it's, he is doing this, but because one is already up here, we're not really seeing that. But then when he says, that's all that I know, we see a very different gesture. We see the same gesture from earlier when she asked him why he disappeared. We see the hands go up like this. That's all that I know. And to me, it's really just sort of sealing my opinion on that, that that's a stop gesture. That's all I know. That's all I got. Stop. That's it. That's the end. So the same way earlier he said, when she said disappear, I don't like that. I don't like this. Stop that. It's the same thing we're seeing here. That's all I know. That's all I got. Stop. I have no part in any of that. So you feel Jamie might have saved his daughter? A hundred percent. I feel like he saved her back then. But as you... Okay, so the thing that's most interesting about this is a question that is really important in this interview, potentially the most important question where she asks if he feels that Britney's father uh, saved her with this conservatorship. And his answer is no hesitation, no balance, just you know, 100%. He even says 100%, I feel that he saved her back then. So, so notice what that back then does that sentence. If it wasn't back then, it was he 100% saved her, that would be a really drastic statement because like, okay, maybe you think that her life was out of order, something had to be done, maybe for a year or two he could have done that while she sorts herself out, but I don't think anyone can argue that a 13-year conservatorship where she didn't have her life at all is saving her life. It's, I, I don't think anybody can really argue that position. So by throwing back then, it's sort of 100% but back then. So it takes away from that 100%. It kind of takes that 100% and brings it down to a 73.8%-ish. Right at the end, we see a pretty common gesture as after he says that sentence, he kind of pouts a little and nods. He goes like this. It's very quick because they, they cut away so we don't see the full thing, but that's basically what it looks like. And this is something very common in people who, it basically translates to, I'm putting my foot down, like yeah. I, I believe that. And we often see it in situations where someone says something controversial and people look at him like, did you just say that? And they go, yeah, I totally said that. So he knows, he knows this is a controversial statement. And I think that's the reason that back then is there because now he could defend it by saying, no, no, I didn't say it's 100% right. I said it was 100% right back then. But at the end of the day, I feel like his position on this is, is pretty extreme. And I, I would have personally liked to see a little bit more from him that backed her up and said she was going through a lot we both were uh and, and maybe at the time you know this was right but but you know it went on for too long there would have been other ways to handle this he seems committed to this really extreme way to deal with something that i think could have been dealt with in a lot of other ways also notice right at the end there's a shift in cadence and this is rare for him usually he's pretty monotonous and he speaks pretty clearly but right at the end as he goes 100% I feel like he saved her back then. Like he almost mutters that end. So his confidence is actually fading. So 
there's a contrast. It's 100%, but then there's, there's all these little caveats. Like back then, and he's also kind of lowering that tone, like I'm not so sure he's 100% confident. Both of them were happy for her, you know, because it's not always about what's right. It's about this is what mom wanted, you know, mom. And there it is. That is the sentence in the whole interview that I dislike the most. Now, to be fair, it could have been edited because he doesn't even finish his sentence. He says, this is what mom wanted. Mom got, and then it cuts and it goes to other stuff. So we don't know exactly where he was going with that. Also, we don't quite see the question in the beginning. So to give him the benefit of the doubt, this could be out of context. But if we look at what he said, he's talking about how his kids felt about the end of the conservatorship. And he says, it's not always about what's right, but this is what mom wanted. She got what she wanted. So basically what she wanted is the end of the conservatorship, but you're saying that that's not what's right because it's not about what's right. It's about ending the conservatorship. So are you saying that it would have been right to keep the conservatorship going? Because that's a really difficult position to defend. So I would love to know why he contrasts the right thing with the end of the conservatorship. It's really not a great look. I want to throw this in right now, really important. Uh, for those of you who want to watch the whole segment, there's a link in the description and there's a lot more story, a lot more context. And a lot of you might ask me why I didn't do any analysis of the sun, because in the segment, there are numerous clips and you can go watch it where they interview her son. And the reason I'm not doing that is because he is a teenager uh, caught in the middle of something that I'm not a thousand percent sure he understands. You can go watch the interviews and do your own analysis, but in my opinion, there's a certain narrative that's been pushed on him. And I'm very aware of the fact that when I make these videos, they stay on the internet for a very long time. And over the next couple of years, as he ages, or maybe later on in his life, he might see it from a different angle. He might start to see that the narrative that's been heavily pushed on him isn't necessarily the only narrative. And I think he might have some reflections about what he said and his position. And I don't want to break down the behavior of a teenager who I think doesn't fully understand what's going on. I mean, even his father right now said in this interview, he tries to explain to them. They have a lot of questions. So I just don't want to go there out of respect. So they, the boys have decided that, you know, they, they're, they're not seeing her right now. It's been a few months since they've actually even seen her. All right, in that answer, we're definitely seeing a cluster of stress. Now I'm saying cluster of stress, not cluster of deception, because I don't think he's being outright deceptive. I think he's hiding the full truth or putting it in the most delicate way possible. But if this wasn't an interrogation, I would definitely want to ask a little bit more questions about how this decision came about. Because I think there's more to it than the boys just made this decision. Here's what we're seeing. First of all, we're seeing speech disfluency. His language is falling apart as he's stammering. They, 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 so yeah, so, so a lot is falling apart of the language. Then we're seeing little gaps of hesitation as he's filling in with filler words that we call verbal leaks. So yeah, so, um, so all this together kind of creates what I call fluff. Just a lot of fluff to get to the answer. Go look at it again. Look at how many, so he goes, yeah, so the, the, the boys have decided, you know, they, they're, they, so all this falling apart with all these filler words to actually get to the answer. We're also seeing heavy grooming with the one hand on his shirt like this. Usually when we see like people picking at their clothes, sometimes they pick lint or they pick sort of their clothes, this is a very nervous, high stress thing. So as he's stammering, as his brain is slowing down, he's trying to find the right words, he's grooming here, he's stressed about this, it all looks very stressful. Also, he's once again trying to control the narrative here as he's saying they decided, the boys decided. So he's not just laying down the facts, like the boys haven't talked to their mom in a while, he's saying they decided, it's their decision. It's important for him to say that. So overall, at the end of the day, do I think that the kids decided to not talk to her? I do, but I think that that decision was heavily influenced by outside factors. I think him, I think other family members. That's why I'm saying, I don't think it's outright a lie. We're seeing that stress there, and I guess it's the same cluster of stress, cluster of deception. The bottom line is, in an interview, I would wanna ask him more questions about that and say things like, how did they come up with that decision? 
Did you talk to them about that? What was your opinion? Did you encourage them? And I would try to go down that path and see how much of that decision was really the kid's decision. If instead of me, Brittany was dead, sitting here, what would you tell her? I don't know. It's really, that's a, like the toughest, one of the toughest questions, you know? I try to think about that question. You know, it's hard to like tie it all together because I would want to apologize and then give advice and then ask if there's any way I can help. Okay, so first we have to try to not fall into the television production emotion trap. That music they're playing while he's talking, it forces us to feel bad. It forces us to feel sad. That sort of slow piano with the sort of the minor chords. It's hard to say anything with that type of music in the back and not feel sad for someone. So let's tell our mammal brains to ignore that. Let's just look at the answers, the demeanor, because to be honest, the music is sadder than he is. We're not really seeing you know, quivers or anything that would indicate, we're not seeing droopiness, we're not seeing anything that would indicate that he's actually experiencing sad emotions here. There are thoughts happening. So, so he starts with the eyes looking down and left, and as he's talking, they shift down and right. And I don't really subscribe to that thing with the eyes, like up and right is you're, you're making up something, and up and left is real recall. That's not, that's been disproven. If you look at people's eyes, people do different things with their eyes, but typically, typically, we go downwards with internal monologue or deep emotions. That's something you can rely on because it makes a lot of sense that when we're sad, we, we look down. Sadness is down, happiness is up, sadness is down. So when we're emotional in the, in the sadder sense, we tend to go down. So I think there's a little bit of, he's thinking back here and there's deep emotion. I think there's an internal monologue in there. He's talking to himself, trying to figure out what he would say. But on the other hand, isn't this something you've thought about a lot? Like with the end of the conservatorship, with this interview coming up, wouldn't you think he has an answer to what he would say to Brittany if she was in front of him? It takes him a long time to get to, again, any semblance of an answer. And this isn't the first time in this interview where there's a lot of fluff and he's hesitating and he says, you know, about 684 times. And you know is interesting. A lot of analysts call you know like a short non-answer statement because like, you know, that doesn't answer the question and it buys time. I call it fluff. Some pair it with hesitation. You know, different analysts have different words for it. But all these you knows and hesitation, he's just building time to get to an answer. And finally, after all that, his answer is, I would apologize, I would give advice, I would ask if there's any way I can help. None of that is specific. Well, except for the ask if there's any way I can help. Apologize, for what? Give advice, for what? It's nice that he would apologize, but, but I would love to know what he would want to apologize for. Does he take accountability for a lot of what happened to her? Because that would be a big step. And then he says, give advice. What advice? Why do you feel like you're in a position where you can give her advice? She's gone through something very unique. She lived through a level of stardom that most people can't even dream of. Uh, you know, he took a lot of attempts at fame, never even got close to 0.5% of her. Where, what advice? Why do you feel you can give advice? I feel like that's a little bit of a ego play there to say he can give her advice. I don't think too many people on this planet can give Britney Spears advice on how she's supposed to feel about everything that's happened. It's nice that you would apologize, but the fact that you think you have advice to give on this kind of makes me feel like you don't understand the gravity of what she's gone through. 13 years, a prisoner of her own life. So yeah, I, I, I don't think, Kevin Federline, that you're in any position to give her advice. But again, I would love to give him the benefit of the doubt and for, have the interviewer ask him, what advice? What advice do you feel you can give her? That would have been good interviewing, which I think lacked here. I think we sh they should have dug a little bit more here. It would have been really awesome. So there it was. Uh, definitely a lot of mixed feelings here. I can see why fans of Britney Spears would be irritated by this interview. There seems to be a lack of accountability. There seems to be a lack of a balanced view. Uh, for me, it's a lot about him defending what he did and his kids. And there seems to be genuine concern for his kids, but a lack of concern for their mother. So I could see why Britney Spears fans would be very irritated by this. Now, I think we can all agree that yes, Britney went through some pretty intense stuff 
I think anyone with even the slightest experience in psychology can look at some of the videos that she had back then on the news, even recently on social media, and yes, there's a lot going on. She does need help, she did need help. I don't think any Britney Spears fans are looking at her and going, no, she's just fine, let her be. She would have been fine, she's fine now. I don't think anybody thinks that. But I do believe that a more compassionate, a more caring, a more loving approach would have been much better than a 13 year conservatorship, which was basically, you can't handle all this money and fame, so we're just gonna take it and do whatever we want with it. So to stick strictly to behaviors, I'm seeing here someone who is very much on one position, who is speaking on behalf of himself and his kids, and we're not seeing a ton of compassion. Whenever there's unpleasant things, he's trying to turn around them, that's where we're getting that fluff and that sort of delaying what he's trying to say to get some sort of acceptable answer out. So at the end of the day, it's a very dodgy interview from a behavioral standpoint. But again, I'm always aware of the fact that these mainstream media clips, they're edited with a certain intention in mind, and I don't know what that intention is. So maybe they're putting things there that are a little bit more dramatic, that are gonna get more of a reaction out of people. So I would appreciate a longer, unedited interview with Kevin Federline to get a better idea of what's actually going on in his head rather than these little select clips. But let me know in the comments, what is your position on this? Where's your head at? What are you seeing? And, and what are you seeing in the behavior in this interview? Let me know in the comments. Hope you enjoyed it and I will see you on the next one.